it's 9.30, so I guess we're supposed to start now. Um, so this is uh, Ethics Beyond the Plate, if I remember the name correctly. I, I came up with the name, and part of it was a concern that too much at vegan-oriented events is just about food and not even about diet and what it means to us. Um, or it's about nice things like um, specific animal-saving endeavors that there's just kind of this assumption, oh, the ethics are in the right place, and here's some things we do about it. And this is going to be more talking about the ethics and also about how I, I'm going to project for myself here, but often the reasons that led us to veganism in the first place often lead us to <coughs> views and opinions and ethical bases in other areas of, of social justice, environmentalism, etc. Um, we have a great panel of people here. There's a lot of them, um, which I think is wonderful, but um, you know, it's a, it's a big panel, so hopefully we won't uh, break under our own weight in that regard. Um, I'm just going to introduce them really quickly, starting closest to me. We've got Lee Chantel, who does uh, Viva La Vegan and Green Earth Group uh, here from Australia. Uh, Jamie J. Hagen, um, who does her own blog and also has written in a lot of other places, um, including Autostraddle, Dart Society, One Green Planet. And on the issues, who's next? Laura Beck <laughs> from Vegan Saurus, Jezebel, Veg News, I, whatever, that's enough. Um, <laughs> Eric Larson, um, who did the Cosmopolitan Hour podcast, did the Soy Fucker Zine, and now does Sows Before Grows and the San Francisco Comical, which I know nothing about, but uh, I will check them out. And um, John McDevitt from the Laziest Vegans in the World blog and the Teal Cat Project. And I'm going to start, um, just we'll go down the line in that same order. We'll start with Lee Chantel. And I'm just wondering. What does vegan mean, what does veganism mean to you, and what do you mean when you say that you're vegan? Okay, so veganism to me is just my way of leading by example to promote love, peace, and compassion to the world. So that sort of wraps up in a nutshell, but um, also it, it encompasses everything I'm passionate about, so animal rights, feminism, environmental issues, human rights issues, um, just everything, and the, more, the longer I'm vegan, the the more that I realize it helps those sort of things. Um, yeah, very similar. Um, I would also say that veganism for me is about making the most compassionate choices possible in the circumstances you're under. So, um, I think that's where we get into this now. Because <laughs> that's complicated. Um, but, yeah, and it really depends on the context in which I'm communicating with people, whether I focus on the dietary aspects or whether or not I focus more on um, having an awareness of um, more marginalized um, communities and, and discussing like, a vegan aspect way of looking at it. Um, I agree with both of those ladies. Um, veganism, I think, is an amazing ethical opportunity to make the most compassionate choice you can in the situation that you're in. <laughs> um, for me, veganism is uh, it's about a compassionate lifestyle, um, and it's, it's just one aspect of uh, the greater whole of my activism, and it's uh, just one uh, outlet through which I show uh, you know, compassion and struggling for a more just and sustainable world. Pretty much what they all said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I come from, a, from more of the food perspective. But since being on this panel, I kind of reevaluated why I do it. But basically, what they all said, and I love cows. <laughs> <laughs> so a word came up there that um, I'll, I'll be honest—I wasn't expecting, although I'm not surprised. But the compassion, and you all either said it or said it, at least you agree with the other person who said it. Um, you know, compassion is a. That George Bush was famously a compassionate conservative. Um, and I think compassion is a, is a difficult thing to measure, and it is more about your intentions than it is about your actions. So starting at the other end with John, how do you, how do you take that from, I'm a compassionate person, I mean well, and we all know there's a lot of people in the world who would say that and believe it from the bottom of their heart and do things that we would find ethically abhorrent. How do you, <coughs> How do you put compassion into practice? Um, I think, you know, obviously by example, 
I mean, you know, I, I think most of my that, that not food related stuff is teal cat project. So, and that's actually the reason I went vegan was my cat. So, as far as that end, I I kind of focus on the teal cat there. But tell us a little quickly. Um, about it's that. basically uh, we raise money for a trap neuter release organizations. Um, Theoretically, tra trap neuter release is the best way to reduce the cat population. So it's kind of it's kind of what I focus on as far as like everyday vegan. I mean, just being a good example. You know, I'm I'm not really a super activist vegan. I just I try to make veganism look accessible and fun. I think that's a really good way to you know turn people on to it. Because originally I didn't, I went vegetarian first for health reasons, and then I ended up going vegan for ethical reasons. So I kind of see both sides of it. Um, for me, I feel like uh, acting compassionately is not, it's not a, a goal or a destination, it's more of a journey, much like veganism itself. And even if you've been vegan for 20 years, I think, and you know, been an activist in any particular community for a number of years, um, I think it's really important to constantly re-examine yourself. Just because you've done consciousness raising in the past to get yourself to a point where you embrace a vegan lifestyle doesn't mean that you, can't, you don't need to ever revisit that or think about um, what that means to you in a new uh, period of time in your life or a new space in your life. Um, so, yeah, not falling into complacency, thinking, well, I'm, I'm, I eat vegan, so I'm doing well enough. You know, constantly re-examine, um, you know, what you're doing. But also forgiving yourself if you fall a little short. You know, not everybody can do everything possible to create a compassionate world, unless, you know, we probably just go extinct and die. Um, but, yeah, for me, being compassionate, it's about um, forgiving yourself, forgiving others uh, for making mistakes, learning from your mistakes. Um, yeah, just checking yourself, moving forward, and and uh, being compassionate towards others, forgiving, blah blah blah. I'm just gonna pass on to Lauren because I'm louder. That's really good. I agree with everything that they both said. Um, for me, compassion I think is like very much the principle of do unto others, um, and I just extend others to animals as well. I think that that's often where other people stop sh short. Um, so for me, compassion. Uh, is about how things are, right? Um, but that's just saying that that's where the conversation starts, right? Because there, we have to have a community that establishes these social norms, and that's where the importance of bringing in different social justice movements comes, I think. And that's partially why I was so interested in the comment conversation I had yesterday, because that's a real great opportunity. Of, I mean, I do believe that most people who are out there writing as vegans come from an intention of causing at least harm to being compassionate and you know, from a place um, of compassion. But uh, yeah, so I think that really feminism offers a really great way to have this dialogue to um, maybe check with ways in which we are completely not aware that we're missing the boat. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's a lot about it. It, which you know, is what you were saying about the consciousness raising. You know, it's not like it happens when you're 18 and then you, you, nothing changes in terms of your ethical frame framing. Um, so. I think for me, um, compassion encompasses a lot of different things. So, like um, other people on the panel have mentioned, is about how I I interact with other people. So, in a one-on-one -on -one basis, not being judgmental. Like someone says, I'm a vegetarian. It's like, wow, that's a really great step. Let me know if you want some information about veganism. If um, you know someone's talking about how they're trying to limit animal products in their diet, you know, encouraging that rather than going, oh well, you know, you should be doing this and this as well. And it's also um, in person and also online. I do a lot of social media etiquette talks, and um, it, for me, I find it really horrible the way that people um, interact with people online just because they are anonymous or just because they may never actually meet someone online. I think that's really bad for our movement. I think that's a really um, negative thing that we need to get on top of and um, 
I also think it's just um, like I think Eric has said about yourself as well, you know, just take it step by step sometimes and, you know, just act, don't react, I think is the biggest lesson to learn and um, I've, I've just been in Southeast Asia for six months and just learning from other cultures and just um, opening your mind and your heart to um, experiencing what other people go through and where they are in life and not judging it because from from where we are and like say for example Portland in this little vegan hub and you're not really necessarily aware of um, other people and what they go through and um, whether they can or can't be a vegan so just keeping all those things in mind and not really not judging people from where they are in their place in life. I'm, I'm going to jump on to uh, the last thing Lee Chantal said there for the next question which is and I think you know, being in Portland is, is a very good place to ask this from, but um, the notion of, of privilege, and relatively speaking, everybody in this room is extremely privileged relative to other humans in the world, and certainly to non-humans in the world. And that can be a delicate line, um, and it's something that certain animal rights and veganism people deal with a lot. It's definitely something in other social justice movements that comes up a lot. Um, you mentioned being in Southeast Asia, and you know, some parts of Southeast Asia, everything's dandy. Other parts are, you know, basically the the back end of the world where it's the reason we have cheap stuff here. Um, it's the reason we have palm oil here, things of that nature. Um, how do you not end up paralyzed by your privilege? Because this is a problem I have where I feel like, you know, everything I'm doing is causing a problem down the line for someone else. Um, so how, how do you move past that paralysis and also how do you communicate in your own activism, advocacy, writing, whatever it is, how, how do you get past that where, yeah, these people well, you know, have, have a very different situation, very different background, um, but we still want to move towards a more vegan world and a more socially just world. Um, I guess, I guess for me, um, when I was in Asia, like one, like the massive thing is the um, different language that people speak. So I gave a lot of talks, and I had to wait for people to translate, and I've never, I've never done that before. So that was quite a learning experience. So if your website or if your blog is predominantly English, then there's a hell of a lot of a population out there that are, are not able to read what you're actually writing because they don't speak English. Um, and also I gave talks, a lot of people wanted to know how to make cakes and I've never baked so much in my life actually when I was there and um, how to make cheese. So I was showing people how to make, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a lot of videos on YouTube of people are vegan and one of them, one of my most popular is a, how to make vegan cheese sauce with nutritional yeast flakes. And that was quite hard to find over there. So um, at a couple of places like organic health stores, you could buy it for twelve dollars for a little pack. Um, the Bragg's one, and um, a lot of people, some people make two dollars a week for selling tempeh. So how it's it's just ridiculous to say you need to buy this to make this cheese, this cheese sauce. Um, whereas they, you know, have their own cows and things like that. So. Um, yeah, it, that, that was a, a, quite an eye-opener for me, to be honest, and it did definitely make me go, wow, okay, I can afford $12 for nutrition and yeast, but a lot of people can't. So it's just, you know, it, I think for me it's just educating people, and I am in a privileged situation, and I am grateful and thankful for that all the time. And it's just using your skills and your abilities and your talents and not preaching and not trying to convert people rather than, uh, for me now, it's like educating and planting seeds and just, you know, leave it, see where the wind takes everyone type thing. Um, for me, this is a huge thing. I, um, my work in human security and working um, in international relations, uh, I'm about to go into a doctoral program where I'm like one of the two Americans in the program, and um, which is great. But the issues I want to work on are in refugee camps in countries where I'm definitely in a very privileged position to be working on this. And um, so I just see my place of privilege as a great opportunity for amplification of other people. I also don't need to reinvent the wheel for certain, you know, there are communities already working on these issues in other countries, so I don't need to reinvent it for them. I can write an article and amplify their voice. I can um, find, you know, try to encourage different platforms to uh, you know, in include these different
different voices or, you know, interview people, you know. It is about finding those voices, I think, and sort of including them in your activism. Um, so for me, like, I, I, I try to utilize my place of privilege as an opportunity. Um, but, you know, of course, that's, it's an existential crisis, you know, of course, it definitely is, um, because I wouldn't be getting a PhD if I didn't want to also be an expert. So, you know, <laughs> you know I'm also going to be going into situations sitting there and saying, I know what I'm doing. But, um, you know, so I, I see both sides, but I do think there is an opportunity there. Yeah, I, um, I think, like, it's really important to be aware of your privilege, but also your privilege awareness can be stagnifying in a lot of ways. Like, some people, get like, <clears throat> I see this a lot on one of the blogs that I write for, and it's like, people are so like, aware of like checking their privilege and talking about their privilege, and you know, and that it like kind of stops them from doing anything, because it's like ultimately, like you know, we do have, I, I have a better than like 99% of people on this planet, like so I need to recognize that, and then I agree with Jimmy, I need to use my voice to empower other people, and it's, it, I really do think it's this exciting, ethical opportunity that we're so lucky to have and if we waste it it's kind of it's a big fucking waste like you know it's like a very like Buddhist thing like you have to live for people who don't who, who don't have the ability to live because like it's just we're really lucky like we've got lucky who we are and we need to make choices to to help others so that includes animals and people yeah further to what Laura said I think um a big principle I live my life by is, you know, I'm vegan because I can be, um, so why wouldn't I? But not everybody can. Uh, I think it's a really fine line, it's a fine balance between, you know, spreading veganism and getting people interested in a vegan uh, lifestyle and, you know, something that's ultimately better for themselves and the planet and animals. Um, but it's also, you know, you also need to balance that with creating uh, a permanent and sustainable interest in veganism and compassionate lifestyle. And um, you can't do that by talking down to somebody from a place of privilege. So yes, being aware of your privilege is absolutely essential. But like Laura said, don't let it paralyze you. Um, your privilege can be a tool to help others. That's why it's called privilege. You don't have to, instead of sharing and keeping it all to yourself, you can use your privilege to help others out. Um, and I think given the global context of, of Westerners, and you know, I think we can all agree that uh, you know, although there are, are you know, there are definitely uh, cultures in the world that have a, you know, a default vegan diet. Um, I think we can all agree that modern day veganism is kind of a Western phenomenon, or at least that's how it's viewed in the world. And so given the global context of Western cultures imposing upon uh, third world cultures, I think we, you know, we have to tread delicately and remember and, and recognize that the onus is on us to learn about their culture and not on them to adopt our culture. So we need to make veganism accessible to other people rather than you know, fitting them into our vegan boxes. People are not going to be vegan unless they see themselves in the vegan community or they see a place for themselves in the vegan community. When you pose that question, I promise to only bring worse at a point. But uh, <laughs> it reminded me of his quote that he said, you know, the Chinese are subhuman because of subspecies because of how they treat their animals. And, you know, I kind of thought, like, you know, different countries are in different places than we are or in the West. So you just kind of have to be open-minded. It's like, yeah, you know, I prefer everyone treat animals the same, but, you know, not, we're not all at the same place. So I kind of keep that quote in my mind. It's like, no, I mean, you know, everyone is not, you know, Western American or English. Or, so that's kind of what I always remember. It's like. You know, we're really lucky you know, to be in this space where I'm right now. And, and what could be worse than how we treat pigs? Like exactly. Cows. Exactly. Like, yeah. That's, <clears throat> that's true. Yeah. You know, their dogs are our pigs. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we got into this a, just a little bit, but um, in, in fact, I think that the Chinese thing you brought up, I mean, racism, huge issue, um, imperialism, cultural imperialism. Um, certainly people in the West thinking our way is the best and that includes things like the, the vegan movement where there's, you know, it started in England it being, you know, plenty of people who were around when veganism was founded are still alive, but they're old, but still. Um, and, you know, it, it is a new thing. It probably is an imperfect thing. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of things you could say are sort of checklist vegan, but are Again, com coming from a bad place, just just because a pair of shoes isn't leather doesn't mean right. um, they, uh, the the 
that the world is a better place for them having been manufactured and shipped and sold and you know all, all the stuff that falls along with that. And there's a lot of people in the world who are very ethical and care a lot about the same issues we do, um, who get involved in environmental causes, social justice causes, could be labor, could be uh, gender issues, could be the ch children issues, whatever. Um, so the, sort of the social justice movement broadly, um, and just sort of left politics. So you know, the socialism and, and all that. Um, so anti-capitalism, I should say. Um, and within these social justice movements, there is not always a lot of room for non-humans. And I assume some of you have bumped heads with that. Others may not have directly, but probably still have opinions about it. Why do you think this is? Why do, why do people who care so much about social justice generally not cross the species barrier? And since it is that way, how do we, how do we fix it? What, what steps can we take to, um, to increase the intersectionality across the species barrier? And start with John. <laughs> we can start somewhere else if you want. No. Okay. Um, I think, uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I thought you were going straight to lead. Okay. No um, I, I have a pretty good anecdote about this, actually. Great. Uh, in 2008, I uh, spent three months working on the campaign uh, No Against Proposition 8 in California. Um, in case you're actually familiar, it's, yeah. it's in the Supreme Court right now, but in case you have been under a rock for the last <laughs> five years, um, Proposition 8 was um, the law that unfortunately narrowly passed in the 2008 election, which made gay marriage illegal again in California. Um, and so I was working on the campaign to save gay marriage, and um, some of you may not know that in 2008, there was also a ballot measure um, in California, Proposition 2, which um, gave, uh, which mandated uh, certain spaces for uh, battery heads. It included, it uh, basically rolled out a lot of um, food animal improvements. Um, you know, obviously didn't do away with uh, food animal production altogether, but it provided a better quality of life for those uh, animals that were unfortunately in that system. And so, although I was spending, you know, 60 to 80 hours a week, um, very passionate about saving gay marriage. I was also very passionate about Prop 2 and ensuring that you know farm animals had better uh, standard of life in California. And I remember the day after the election, it was my birthday. It was the worst birthday ever because we lost. <laughs> um, you know, all my friends were crying because they couldn't marry their loved ones. And um, and I remember one of my friends, who I, I love deeply, um, you know, in a moment of anger, said, you know, animals have more rights, and our chickens have more rights in California than I do right now. And I, you know, I understood his anger, and you know, and I put myself in his shoes. And um, but you know, what I did was I was just the good vegan ambassador, and I said, you know, I totally understand, but that's not true. You know, you have the right to not be put in a cage your whole life and then killed before your prime and be eaten. Like, and, and as far as I know, chickens never had the right to get married in California. So um, it's, it's you know, it's it's just the same as in veganism. You know, there's a lot of vegans who don't recognize their own privilege and they say racist things. As mentioned or you know classist things or you know sexist things um, it's, it's just the exact same thing it's just about being patient with people and saying hey you know you maybe miss the blind spot and I'm here to tell you that that you know you're actually wrong about that don't be confrontational don't be angry because that's just going to shut it down uh, but you know just be be the good vegan ambassador because as we all know whether we like it or not we represent all vegans in the world right <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Um, yeah, th to that point, like, to be the good vegan ambassador, I think it's important to speak up and be compassionate towards the person, even if they're being a total um, jerk to you. <laughs> I'm trying to think of an acceptable word for that. Yeah. <laughs> Proud. Um, but just to really just to stand up for yourself and stand up for animals. Like, you have, you have opportunities every day to do it, and it makes people think, like, even if they're really... Like, I'm not saying to get in a troll war with somebody who's like, vegan's delicious, and you're like, okay, that's terrible, but, you know, like, it's like, you can, you can say, like, someone said something in the, and, the, and Jamie's thing yesterday with comments, like, you know, that makes me sad when you say that, like, you know, like, just like something to be like, hey, it's not okay for you to, like, you know, say that around me. It's like when you, it's like when someone says something homophobic or racist for you to, like, just say, hey, that's not okay with me, and, like, I think, like, the more, that person might not go vegan tomorrow, but they'll become more aware of, like, what veganism is and, like, associated with
associated with like a positive person and a good person who is like living by their ideals and like so I think just to to be vocal and compassionate is important. Um, so compassion fatigue is a real thing, um, and you know I on my Facebook I follow a people talking about sexual and reproductive health rights, uh, you know global governance, uh, vegan issues, uh, LGBTQ rights, you know, and sometimes I'm I and Twitter is you know so. Um, I think a really great way to deal with that is to actually have issues that do overlap, right? You know, when you have issues of, you know, climate change and then brighter green and does the work they do, uh, talking about how unsustainable bringing factory farms uh, to Asia and, you know, increasing the meat in people's diet there to you know, what we're eating in the West. I, and, and like for example, Adyar is a really great issue that people who might not necessarily have the patience or energy to well, and, and, and I mean, or at this point in their life aren't ready to take the time to read about uh, vegan ethics, um, can read about the Adyar bills and be like, that's completely horrible, and I, I don't stand by that from a perspective of you know uh, privacy rights or different you know just different uh, or first uh, free speech you know things just different issues that they are actually completely on board with uh, supporting. So um, I, so I think sometimes it's about the angle that you take in, in promoting these different vegan issues where people could say, oh, that's about food security. I can see how that's an issue that I have time for. Yeah. Um, so. I think um, it's just working across all the different groups as well. So for example, um, you can find uh, something that you have in common with environmental groups or feminist movements or um, human rights issues. And keep in mind as well, if you're trying to work with those other groups, um, you need to be accepting of other people to come into the vegan movement as well. So um, whether or not someone's vegan, you know, you accept them into the movement and try not to be judgmental and, um, you know, work across all these all these different areas and that really helps. And I think I think the biggest issue, which I find I find hard to handle at times, is that um, as much as we want rights for animals, like the majority of people don't agree with that animals do have rights, and um, you know just the way certain people go about trying to promote that, I think is counterproductive, and um, it's um, it's really like I don't agree a hundred percent with any animal rights group or any group that exists at the moment, but there's so many good things that a lot of these groups do have that you can focus on, that they do undercover stuff, or they get so many, uh, so much information out to people that other people might might not see. It doesn't mean I'm going to promote certain groups, of course, but there's always things that you can learn from other groups, from other movements, and just, for me, it's just all about finding that common ground with someone that you can connect with someone and um, you know, amplify it instead of finding the things that um, disconnect you. If I want to have please. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I was thinking uh, like the most anti-vegan group would be like hunters. Well, hunters hunt deer because they think they're doing the right thing by lowering the deer population, which is kind of understandable. You know, they, they think they're actually doing something good. And so you kind of have to look at it like, they're doing it with the best intentions, even if it's like crazy wrong, but you know, you just have to be like, okay, so they think they're doing the right thing. And honestly, I don't know if there's a vegan answer to deer population, but being from like the home of steaks, like it's kind of like you really have to be open and listen to people, and at least see their perspective. Even if you don't agree, at least try to put yourself in your shoes. You know, to pick up on the, the hunting thing, I mean, a, a lot of the, the natural space that is protected, at least in the United States, we have hunters to thank for that. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the state forests and the national forests, it's, I mean, it, this stuff exists because the people who wanted to have wilderness to hunt in lobbied for it. And that sucks. Well, that's I, scary for an Australian. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's, that may be an American problem, but then it may be, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and it's like, you know, the reason there's so much woods in Pennsylvania is 
so that the hunting lobby wanted it. Um, and I still haven't figured out what I think of that. Um, so to, to, we, we got a little bit into the awe person in that last question, but I, I do want to run it by you guys again. But this would be that within the animal rights or the vegan community, there are often giant blind blind spots about environmental or social justice issues. It's I'm saving animals. I don't care how many plastic clamshells this is. I don't care that these shoes are PVC. The people in the factory made no money and got raped. I don't care that the person working at Walmart made no money and got raped. They're not that there, you know. So there's there's that side of things. There's the people who are show up, use the word vegan, but are really only concerned about their health. And you know, if it's a superfood, it's good for them, and it doesn't matter what environmental destruction was brought in its path, what kind of human exploitation was brought in its path. Um, and we often share, I'm not going to say share stage, but you know, uh, we, we share a group identity with these people. Um, and I'm going to assume everybody up here is concerned, at least on some level, about environmental issues, labor issues, human rights issues. And again, why do you think that is? I, I would love to hear sort of some, even if it's wild speculation, how you think we, we get to a point like that. And then also, what are the best things we can do about it? Um, I know some of you touched on it already, but but here more. Yes. And how do you speak to people in our community about these issues? Well, in our own community, or people who maybe you don't feel like are in a community with you, but they they still they still seem to be playing their decisions around animal issues or around the vegan word. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I'm going to say I don't feel community with a lot of people who use the word vegan. Um, and I find a lot of people who just use, does it contain animal products or not, as, as their only guideline, and still, to me, are, are doing a lot of very unethical things, but, you know. Um, I, I did an interview with a Toronto um, radio station last week, and um, one of the questions was about um, how the um, media portrays um, veganism and commercialization of veganism, and um, it, um, for me, it's definitely, well, I think it's just my issues with mainstream media, to be honest, and just the way people think that they should act or the things that they want to promote because someone's really hot or um, whatever, the, like the superfoods seem to be quite big at the moment. Um, and so I think that just depends on what you listen to and the type of people you hang around and things like that. I don't pay attention to um, tabloids or things like that, so I'm not necessarily aware of, of that on a, a massive level like some other people are. But um, I think it's I think it's just um, it's just planting the seeds. I think with any with anything in life, um, it's finding it's like how to create vegans as well. It's just finding what they're interested in. If someone likes gardening, the gardening talk about veganic gardening. If someone's into health, talk about you know chia pudding. If someone's into Bodybuilding, talk about Robert Cheek and Ed Bauer. You know, there's I I just think there's so many different ways that you can um, educate someone. Well, but what about what about the opposite? Them. What if they're already they're um, already vegan, yeah. but they don't they don't get. Well, it's uh, I think it's the same sort of thing. So if someone is in, you find out why they're vegan. So if if someone's a health vegan, then maybe they they might care about. Um, the environmental aspects of you know producing soy, quinoa, um, chia, things like that. Um, if they're really concerned about human rights issues or humans and health, then I'm sure. Well, I would like to hope that they would care about other things in regards to how humans are treated in, in factories and things like that. But but it's also um, you know not everyone's on the same life path as you or we are, and you just really have to sort of. Um, just chill it down sometimes because we're like, come on, there's all these things, <coughs> and there is all these things, but there's also just this, you know, only so many things that you can have in your head at one time, and you know, once you know something, you can't unlearn it. And I find that for a lot of people, it just even veganism, it's just so overwhelming at times. So I think it's just those seeds, and oh, did you know about this, or have you heard about that, and hopefully. They can make a, you know, an ethical decision on those things in the future. Maybe, maybe not now, but you've planted that for, for the future. I live in hope. <laughs> um, I think this is an interesting question about sort of the ownership of the word begin and the identity that people associate with it. Um, I think also to think of it through the framework of the 
issue that we hear so often in feminism is that people don't want to identify as a feminist. <laughs> and so this is a constant conversation. Um, I do the sticker campaign, Feminism is for Lovers, because feminism for me is just so many positive things, but for, it's also just been, again, with this mass media representation, uh, for a lot of people, it's still scary and hateful, and it's a not, it's like a negative. So <clears throat> the fact that so many people know about the word vegan, I mean, I still very often have to explain what veganism is. So, I mean, I see that this is a really interesting conversation for this room, but I don't lose, lose sleep at night, honestly, about um, worrying about the label vegan. Um, and I think it's really great that we're, as, as I understand it, I wasn't at the last conference, but this is, uh, the expanded the conversation around what it means to be vegan immensely, this this conference. So um, I certainly think we're headed in the right direction, and I think that it is going to be uncomfortable to expand and challenge um, uh, what we think ethically it means to uh, be identified as vegan. Um, but uh, yeah, I just just keep in mind that a feminist who's in a room of young students and. <laughs> Owen raises their hand, <laughs> and it's like, what is this about? Um, so that's the position I come from. That's good, yeah. When people ask me about the feminist thing, it's like, do you believe in equality? Then you're a feminist. Um, uh, so I agree. I think it's, this is another really, this is another question that's directly related to privilege. Um, because I live in Los Angeles now in a neighborhood where I can walk up two blocks and get vegan soft serve. So if I don't make the best choices possible at every opportunity, I'm an asshole. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I had this amazing ethical opportunity to think about where my shoes were made and how much they cost and know, oh my gosh, the people who made these make more money than I do, like the people in the factory. Like, I mean, that's exciting to me that I get to do that. But I have a good friend who's vegan. Um, she's my boyfriend's little sister who went vegan because she was like, this is so cool and I'm so into it. And she lives in um, Fairbanks, Alaska. And you know what? Like, she buys her shoes at Payless because she's like, this is the best choice I can make in my situation. And I talked to her last time, I'm like, well, you can order shoes. And, but it's like, well, that's really expensive. She lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. She makes a lot less money than I do. Like, this is the best choice she can make in her situation. And I think that that's kind of what it's about. It's like, and it's a lot of work. It's like, and do you, do you have the privilege to do that kind of work? Do you have, like, the opportunity to think about things like that? And I think, like, probably everyone in this room does. And so it's really cool that we can, like, talk about it and think about it together. But, like, I'm not going to push that onto other people unless I can have, like, a conversation with Rachel, my boyfriend's little sister, like, oh, well, maybe, like, let's think of a way to, like, get you shoes from a different source, like, if you're into it. Like, those are things that we can talk about and engage on in that level, like, in our <laughs> micro community, you know? Um, but, like, when... I just think like yeah, it's, it, it's this ethical opportunity, and if you have the opportunity, you should take, you should, and you should, and ha have to do it. Um, and if you don't, then let's just making people more aware of their choices, that they have choices, and think about them, and like see you making positive choices, and then you know hopefully that will spill out into the world. I think, well, to answer the first part of your question, why uh, why are so many vegans involved in a lot of other communities, I think the answer to that is because um, so many vegans have done consciousness raising already. Um, we've already gone through the process of looking at something, I mean, for most of us, I'm assuming, looking at something that's always, it's, it's just always been that way, and seeing it, it doesn't have to always be that way, seeing the different side of it and understanding a different perspective on it. So I think in that respect, we're more open to new ideas. We're more open to looking at the world in a different way than we're used to and adjusting our ethics and our ideals accordingly. Um, and that's why, because we do more consciousness raising, we're more likely to get involved in other movements because we're more um, able to change our minds. Um, in terms of um, you know, ethics, going you know, beyond just uh, dietary, I, I think, again, uh, veganism is a journey, it's not a destination. <coughs> and like Laura said, privilege comes into it as well. You know, for some people, a vegan diet is all they can do, and it really is the best they can do. And they should be, you know, because they're doing all they can do, we should, we should definitely celebrate them for that. Um, for others of us, we have 
you know, a lot more opportunities. Um, I don't have the in soft serve, and I hate you for that. But, yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> I can walk two blocks and get vegan taquitos. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a journey, it's not a destination. It's about doing um, everything you can, and if you look back and see that you made a mistake, not beating yourself up about it, because what's the use of that? You move forward, you learn lessons, and you move forward. And I think uh, talking with other people, I, I think what Lee Chantel said was really excellent. You know. Talk to them about why they went vegan in the first place and connect that to the message you want to bring them about um, wider ethical issues. Uh, because then that, that's you know, something that they're going to be passionate about is something that they apply to themselves personally. And thus they'll be able to place themselves in those other movements or those other ethical situations a lot easier. Um, and yeah, in general, it's just it's just like getting somebody to go vegan. You can't berate them and expect them like, oh yeah, this sounds great. I just got to yell at them to sign up. <laughs> open-minded, um, you want to talk to them and give them information, but nobody can make that decision but themselves. And you have to recognize that and be at peace with it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I kind of came upon the vegan thing by myself, well, pretty much by myself, my ex-wife. But we just decided, you know, we're already vegetarian, we care about animals, you know, let's go for it. But someone else, I think if you even try to go vegan, you're trying, you know, like you care enough. And the other things just pop up. You mentioned palm oil, and I'm sure we could have a whole 45 minutes on palm oil. But uh, if you ever see my blog, it's like Palm Oil Central. So I kind of <laughs> so yeah, I hate the orangutans. But, <laughs> but when people yell at me, when they yell, they do yell at you. They do. They they yell. At me. But it at least gets me to think. It's like, okay, why are they yelling at me? So, so it, and I totally agree, I mean, the way palm oil is made is totally screwed up. So I think the answer to that is either figure out an alternative to palm oil or sustainably to get palm oil. Right. Which, it seems like, I don't know, Dea is trying to do that, or a lot of the companies, Earth Balance well, is trying, palm oil. Earth Balance is trying in some cases. Right. Organic Earth Balance is actually sustainably harvested. Yeah, yeah. And I think there are other right. stuff they're claiming it is more than it used to be. Or right. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there definitely has to be an answer. I mean, obviously, we can't continue consuming palm oil because it is screwed up. And there's other, you know, other ingredients that, you know, probably aren't ethical, but yet they're vegan. Yes. So I think if people are trying, you know, if they're vegan, I think they have the best intent. You know, so hopefully when people yell at me, it gets me to think, okay, you know, maybe either don't use palm oil at all, or at least when you do use it, think, oh, I'm killing my Right. So. Is that something, I'll, I'll extend this. No pressure. It is my last question. Um, and, and we'll start with John, because it really is picking up right from there. But, you know, once you're aware of something, going to call it intersectionality, but it's, you know, it's between the, the, the veganism and, in this case, the environmental and the habitat destruction of so the orangutans, and, I mean, really, they're the kind of, what's that called, the species, the spotted owl is one. The um, umbrella. Umbrella species? Keystone. Keystone. Well, it's the one that, that gets all the attention, even though, actually, it's, it's the whole environment that's being devastated. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, the orangutans, are, they're big, they're apes. Um, it would be awful if they were extinct, but really, it's it's not just them. You know, we're we're not just we don't just have to save the orangutans. We have to save the whole environment over there. Um, and so you, you know, you become aware of these issues, but you also want to help people eat more vegan food, and often that means eating more palm oil. Right. And you're aware of these issues. You're dealing with it. You're processing it. You're a blogger. You're a writer. We, we all are. How do you approach communicating back out? you know, these dilemmas and these issues. Is it your role when you do mention something to Pablo? Should you put a little asterisk saying, yeah, but, or? Well, I think in my case, most of the vegans that read my blog are like starter vegans. <laughs> like they really just need to know they can switch from an already crappy diet to a crappy vegan diet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I really, I really try not to push that. I think that's more, these ladies, like a little higher, like I've been vegan 10 years, I, I should cook my own food, I should, you know, be more involved. I feel like, I feel like that's what's been lacking and that's kind of why I still do it. Is I feel like maybe I attract people who are like on the edge and they're like, oh, veganism's too crazy. 
So I kind of like that I'm like the bottom at that. <laughs> Which no, I, I really like. You know, I used to be that. You know, that vegan. It's like, oh God, it's so hard to eat. Like, so to worry about all that other stuff, I feel like they're gonna get there. But that's not really my role. Um, I just want to take a moment right now and, and dis disabuse you of the notion that if you've been vegan for more than 10 years, <laughs> you're automatically making gorgeous No, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean. Most of the time, I come home, I'm like, fuck, in another Trader Joe's in July. <laughs> so, um, but in terms of how, how you address that ethical issues with vegans, um, for me, one of my biggest pet peeves in any activism sphere is people who only present problems without solutions. So, mm -hmm. although you know there are a lot of problems, and you know palm oil is obviously a problem, um, I think it's important if there isn't a solution to think about a solution and to not really um, tackle an issue and not to really push it unless you have a viable solution. And it seems well, like there are. I want to jump like, in. Some people would say there's any solution. Don't buy anything with palm oil. Sure. Same that's way a we solution. say don't buy anything with an animal product. That's a solution. Um, you know. It, it, it may not work for some, it may work for, for others, um, but yeah, you know, just say, you know, hey, I don't, I don't eat palm oil, you know, maybe you didn't know this, but, you know, X, Y, and Z happens when you, when you buy palm oil. But, you know, what I do instead is, you know, organic earth balance. They're completely, you know, ethically sourced, or you can get, like, uh, you know, instead of palm oil, like, what is it, like, coconut spread, or, you know, use coconut oil instead. If you present a solution that it makes that problem immediately manageable instead of just this big looming black cloud over somebody's head that's going to make them feel guilt, which is a useless emotion every time they do something. Yeah. I think it's about introducing the question. Like, is this cool with my ethics? Like, um, I think the Food Empowerment Project has that chocolate list. Have you guys seen it? It's rad. And it's like, thank you for providing me yes. with a solution. Exactly. Like, this is the chocolate I can eat. I didn't have to do any research. You know, like, if I really want to eat chocolate, then I'm going to seek out these places, yeah. and like maybe I'll just order, you know, an ton from Vegan Essentials, and then have it for all year or whatever. Maybe I'll decide just not to eat chocolate for a little bit. Like, it, but I have this choice now. Like, I think presenting, introducing the question, and presenting the options. Like, here are the options that I thought of. What are the options that you thought of? Like, and it's exciting if you have yeah. a list of chocolate. You're like, I can I'm eat all, all of this. this. So, That's awesome. It's so it is. It's really really exciting. So I think like. And I think maybe, I'm not sure, we probably disagree on this, but I think people, I think vegan until six is an awesome thing. Like, I think it's, and if, like, I think that people who are abstaining for, you know, until six o'clock, like, that's good. Being vegan is better. Yeah. You know, but that's good, and it's a step. And if it's the only step that someone makes, it's still a hell of a lot more than 95, what is it? How, what's the percent of the population that's vegan? Uh, nobody knows because nobody's actually done the research. There's no way ever. Okay, so let's say it's one percent of the population is vegan. <laughs> like it's still better than ninety-nine percent of the population. Like to make these choices and to be aware of these choices. And you know what? Like I have people who've like read Mark Bittman who like come to me and been like, I I want to take it a step further than what he does, but he introduced the idea to that. I, I want to rewind you, but I want to come back to that yeah. later. But I, I actually really want to get your answer to my original question oh, in this okay. case. No. Um, which, which was how do you as a writer? communicate about the, the intersectionality issues where, let's say you're on a vegan blog and how do you bring up the feminist issues, you're on a feminist blog, how do you bring up the vegan issues? Like, okay, so um, the Bangladesh um, uh, factory, thousand people died. Um, that was an opportunity to talk about where does everything that we consume come from? And I brought that up on Jezebel and it brought up a huge, and then people were like, oh, you're vegan asking me questions about veganism. It was, it's, it's all about, I agree, the intersectionality of it all. Like, the food empowerment's chocolate list. Like, oh, but slave labor, they use kids to make chocolate? Like, chocolate's happy. Like, this is sad. <laughs> Maybe no. You know, like, making these, like, just constantly bringing it up. Like, I do this, um, like, fat girl clothing swap because, like, I want to buy ethical clothes, but a lot of them are made of my size, so I buy a lot of used clothing. And so we have these events, and then we have like Fat Farm Bakery makes these amazing cupcakes, and we have like little like you know what's the connection here? Just making the connection and like showing people, introducing the question to people. Yeah, I mean I think you can also sort of do the leading by example thing, uh, or 
in writing, you know. So for One Green Planet, I did this piece where I interviewed Ethan Wolf, we were talking about yesterday, uh, about the Taji Dalton slaughter. So, you know, you could write an article about what's going on, you can post a film, or you can interview the guy who's going there to, like, do something about it. And why is he doing this? And, and what's your motivation here? And that's really interesting, and maybe I would do that. <clears throat> or maybe it's just interesting to know that there are people doing this sort of work in the world. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, for someone who like doesn't even know about that issue, it's kind of an interesting way to introduce it. Um, and then, you know, like writing about the ag gag bill for policy might for people who like don't know anything about, you know, or haven't investigated that issue at all. Um, <clears throat> to sort of like get into that topic. Um, oh, and for auto straddle, you know, it's specific. It's geared towards the queer community, but I wrote about this conference, and so then. Oh, there's a vegan bloggers conference? That's interesting. <laughs> you know, people would say to me, that's such a niche. I'm like, well, it's sold out. And <laughs> so maybe not. Uh, so, um, I, so I like to write about veganism and animal rights issues for a blog that's like not traditionally, you know, that, that's not for me to focus. So I can sort of like, if it's just a story that's interesting to me, it's vegan. And then, you know, other people can be introduced to it that way. So that's sort of how I try to work it. <laughs> um, with my website, VivaLaVegan.net, I actually um, get other people to write articles um, for specific things. So, like, Mondays is health, Tuesdays is environment, Wednesdays is animals, Thursdays is fitness. So, people that are really passionate about those, um, those things, they can actually write about it. Or people that, um, you know, have backgrounds in environmental science or something like that, they can write specific things that that I, I don't know enough about and that they can uh, they can um, get to a different audience um, you know through through my website and um, I just wanted to share a story um, I'm on the um, worldwide vegan bake sale committee and um, we had someone email us and just say uh, a quite a, a bit of a um, uh, issue about the palm, palm oil and earth balance being promoted and that and um, other people on the committee were upset about this and um, just reacted to it, and I said, oh, I think some. I, I think um, when there's something that people say that you don't really agree with, you sort of just have to sit on it for a while and just try and work out why you react so badly to it. And sometimes it's because there's an element of truth to it, and you need to change, maybe change something, or at least be open to um, you know exploring or educating yourself to something that you didn't already know. And these things come up to educate you. And um, um, I sort of, I sort of said, oh, I think we need to put something at the bottom, like um, you know, this is what this is what a lot of people use. But did you know there's other alternatives available? Um, and also for me, from an environmental perspective, there's a lot of plastic that gets used at events, and um, you know that that is not going to disappear in our lifetime, you know, and. Um, you know, you can use biodegradable um, things. Like we put on um, for my environmental um, group, Green Earth Group, we do a lot of um, events and outreach, in particular with food. And um, it's just serviettes, or you call it napkins. Um, and um, we use biodegradable spoons and um, like paper bags or something, like never plastic. Or people make little tins and jars and things like that. Um, but um, there's always something that you can do better than what you're doing, yeah. I think. That's what it comes down to. And I think you just need to be open to that. And, um, you know, don't just say no to things just because you haven't already thought about it or because you think, because we're vegan, we've already got it all covered because we don't. Yep. That's, yeah. Great. Great. So I'm gonna, I do want to leave time for questions. And so I'm just going to have a, one, one last question for, for all of you. And this is more of a asking for an answer. But it's something that you purchased recently or a decision you made recently that where you did have to make ethical decisions beyond just is it vegan? Um, and if you could just sort of walk us through what was your thought process, what were your concerns, what kind of research did you have to do to even you know fit, to, to please your ethical checklist if you have one. Um, yeah, so just, I'd say anyone who has one ready should start, so the other guy will come up with one. Okay. Um, my shoes. Um, I, have, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're Sockenies, but they're vegan. But of course, they're not made in the United States. They're probably made, I honestly don't know, but they're not made here, so it's got to be 
you know, kids probably made it. So you have to think, well, they're vegan, but, you know, and they cost 40 bucks and they're very comfy, but, you know, it's probably not the most ethical decision. And I think the problem is there's so few vegan shoes anyway, and then you have to weigh, well, okay, if I get, you know, vegan shoes or vegetarian shoes that are made in England, or, you know, I think there's some new balance or something that are made here. You know, you're, you're just kind of weighing it, and it's like, well, I'm going to have these shoes for two years, I'm going to wear the crap out of them, and hopefully in two years there's a better choice out there, maybe. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I guess for me, I, I can't think of anything specific uh, recently, but you know, just in the past few years, I think after uh, reading a lot more about food security and, and um, you know what goes into growing our food, even if even if it's vegan food, um, I guess educating myself more about where vegan food comes from because I already know where the non-vegan food comes from, um, and, and kind of recognizing that in, in addition to eating a vegan lifestyle, it, it's really important to also. Um, and obviously in addition to eating organic, because that's good for your body and the earth. But um, I've really made a concerted effort to only buy local produce and in-season produce as much as possible. Um, nowadays, you know, if I see something on the, the shelf at the grocery store and I see it comes from Argentina or Chile, I'm just, I'm not gonna have it. And I'm pretty much not eating bananas anymore because there are no locally grown bananas. Um, so it's, it's about, um, and obviously I'm in an immense pro position of privilege to do that because I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and pretty much the entire Central Valley of California is just like one giant, enormous, beautiful, fabulous garden. So um, I am extremely privileged to be able to do that and I recognize that, but it's, it's what I can do, so it's what I do do. Um, can it be a poor, poor decision? Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think well, that's a good story. Okay, but I don't even know if this is a good story, but the thing that I can think of is this cup. Um, I am seeing Joni, and <laughs> yesterday, someone I was drinking out of my mug that we were given, mugs specifically, so we didn't use these cups. And I left mine at the hotel, and because I don't have, I normally have what Jason has, and I forgot it at home. And that's what I usually drink everything out of. And I did. I sat there for like five minutes deciding, is my need for coffee more important than my feeling about this cup? Like, and I decided that my need for coffee was more important than my feeling about this cup. And I don't, now I see Joni and I think I made the wrong decision. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'm glad you were alert for the panel. <laughs> but I was awake and able to talk, but, um, so I think like, you know, we don't always make the best decisions and I'm going to show myself some compassion and not go and cry in the bathroom for 20 minutes, but <laughs> like, I'm just aware that I made this choice. Um, for me, this question comes up so much uh, around clothes because I thrift like 80% of my clothes and honestly, it's not all vegan. It's really not. And whether it's because it's made of an animal product or it's because it's made out of something that's synthetic that's really terrible for the environment, at the end of the day, most of the time I give myself, uh, I forgive myself for those things knowing that I'm spending a lot less money and I don't want to be supporting a lot of these chain stores. Um, and, you know, that's sort of where I am right now. Um, I think it's complicated though, and I think that there's, uh, you know, longer probably, like, which things are we willing to give ourselves a pass on and which are we not? Do we want to like have items that like clearly are made of animal products and then have that conversation? Um, I mean that's something that I I think that's a question that's something that I I could write a dissertation about <laughs> because it's complicated for me. But um, and being in New York City and having such an amazing uh, you know it's so much so many thrift stores, it's just made uh, the most sense ethically a lot to just thrift clothing. So, I mean, that's, that would be mine. That was a tough one for me. Yeah, um, Anika and I at the last BBC, we did a um, talk um, about being in fashion and we were talking about similar sort of things and where everyone's mind is about, you know, what, what you would have. And I do a lot of thrift store shopping as well. We call it op shopping and 
Australia. What do you call it? Op. Like op. Op. Yeah, because okay. op, opportunity shops. So, um, op shopping. Um, so it's giving opportunity when you're buying something. It's mostly charity based places. So when you're buying from them, it goes to the charity giving people opportunity to get jobs and that. Um, and um, yeah, so um, a story. Um, I did not have a proper um, winter attire when I came here because I, um, I came to America to escape our winter and I'm not handling the Portland weather. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so Ryan told me complain about that pretty much the whole time. And um, so um, my only shoes that I have, so I can fit them in my backpack, are these ones that fold up that, um, you know, um, I definitely made in China, rubbish. Um, and then when I step on a puddle, all the water comes through. And I was looking at the thrift store around the corner that's all for the hipsters. And um, um, they um, didn't have, they had some shoes, but they were leather. And I, I, I don't buy anything secondhand that's not vegan. Um, and um, I just put up with getting my socks and my shoes wet. Really <laughs> around here, so yeah, it's probably not good. <laughs> We're not here to judge. <laughs> well, thanks. And yeah, I want to open it up to questions now, um, assuming there are any. Yes, back there. Um, I'm really enjoying kind of the Mark Bitten issue because I think like the, the activism um, and then the mainstream kind of thing, what you're talking about with the, you know, like something. Yeah, the, my one question I didn't <laughs> ask was, was more totally Mark Bitten. So. <laughs> <laughs> And I think I've seen your your results, but how do you take something that's you know mainstream and, and he says some stupid things, I, I agree, but how do you take those things that he says that are, you know, well, not quite right and really convince someone that's like, you know, here's the good part of it and then here's the bad here's what he's saying that really isn't quite right. Like do you have any kind of you know opinions views on, on that? Not so, but like the, taking the, the good part of the popular, the, there's a, a prominent popular argument out there, we like part of it but not the other part, and how do we steer that? Without that was, alienating the yeah. process. I have, a, I have an opinion on that. Um, I think that's a lot, I was thinking about this on your um, commenting panel, that's where compassionate commenting comes in. Like if you leave a really smart, well thought out or like comment on the Bittman art, Bittman's articles in the New York Times, they'll get voted up a lot and they'll be, like a lot of people will vote them down too, they'll be like, you know, F off vegan or whatever. But it's like, you know, a lot of people who are, are going to read that who are the people who are saying F off vegan and they're going to think. Like, and I think also then writing about it on your own blog, like here's what I agree with, here's what, here's where I see some problems with Bittman's arguments. Like, and like, just like talking about it, it's such like, because so many blogs pick up what he writes, like you have an opportunity to be part of this conversation and an important part of it. So I think like it's just it's this exciting opportunity whenever he talks about veganism to be like go in there and be awesome and like you know make sense and be you know not be judgy or you know like reactive. Like take some time and like make you know and be like this take, is awesome. Take like, advantage of his of the old of his platform. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I would say that all of the generous egg situation is similar. Where yeah. like as some people. Would like heard about like they're like I didn't even really know that was a thing like I didn't know that was a problem what's the deal about eggs and like backyard eggs and glass and then so you have all these people some people very quickly could be like vegans are so difficult this is impossible or you could say like here's why this is an important conversation to have because someone who's like in the mainstream is talking about it <clears throat> so I, I think you know I think it's not too much. Anyone else want to? Yeah, I think the Mark Bittman thing. It's I think it's positive. I mean, it gets vegan out world, and you know, even if it's till 6 p.m. or whatever it is, I mean, I think it's possible. Better than nothing. Yeah. It's a okay. start. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know too much about what he says other than the basics, but, um, you know, I, I just, I, whenever I give a talk or something to non-vegans, it's always veganism is not a diet and a religion, because they're, they're the biggest issues, I think, that people think um, veganism is. And, to me, it's just another um, thing of saying, you know, don't have these products, whereas I, I think it's more about these are the products that we can consume and there's so many things that aren't 
um, that, that don't, um, you know, encompass cruelty with them. And um, I, I think definitely, it's, you know, it's great to get the conversation starting, but it can be, you know, just from an SEO perspective or something, just mention his name, that's what you probably need to do. And, um, you know, so you can, and the, you know, the Justin Timberlake, Saturday Night Live thing, you know, that, that's cool, you know, I thought that was great. You know, something positive, I find, is better for my, from me to promote rather than someone that um, just, you know, mentions the word be and that maybe doesn't um, encompass the whole lot of it, which is, you know, the lifestyle or, you know, the other things that you choose. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, going back to the discussion about hunting, um, that's always something I like to think about a lot because, I mean, as much as, you know, any of us here would probably never go shoot an animal down, I always think, well, if somebody's going to eat meat, then... That's the best way to get it. Would you, would you shoot down yeah. a they, wild they're animal? Really they're doing the right thing. They're killing it's, the animal and consuming it. And right, versus, versus you know, but yeah, an animal yeah. whose entire existence right. is a product of human intervention. Mm -hmm. So I, I just would be interested to hear a few more just thoughts on that. Well, at least they're, they're killing it and eating it from beginning to end. They actually have ownership of the whole process rather than yeah. just having something start from them and, and packaging from the supermarket. And, you know, they would probably be held a lot less supercritical than a lot of people out there. So I don't agree with it, definitely. But, but it removes the, the alienation. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, they like fully understand every part of the process. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people never will. Anyone else have it? I personally think for uh, hunting to be a true sportsmanlike game, um, there wouldn't be camouflage and there wouldn't be long range rifles. There wouldn't be trucking the animals. animals. Yeah. Or penning them in. Yeah. Or, you know, and they would have guns. guns. And they would have yeah, they would have guns. All deer are armed with knives. But yeah, it's. I, I personally find it abhorrent, but it's. You know, it's slightly less abhorrent than factory farms. You know, at least, exactly, at least the person knows where that meat is coming from. They're fully aware of it, and they have owned it. They have taken that animal's life themselves. And while I don't agree with that at all, um, I can respect that more than somebody who um, outsources that to somebody else. Okay. Anyone else on that? Send it out? Okay. Uh, yeah. So we, <clears throat> we're on blogs, The Gay Vegans, and we get um, like twice a week hate mail from people for whatever reason, gay, vegan, you know, fill the blank. Um, <laughs> the, 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 um, we, we get at least once a week, and, and this I, I thought of the question from your comment, Jason, about um, not feeling a lot of community with people who call themselves vegan. That wasn't your exact phrase, but... Um, we get a lot of, not hate mail, but I think disgust mail from vegans who believe we should stop spending as much time on marriage equality um, while they sit next to their legal heterosexual spouse with <laughs> all their full benefits um, and should spend more time, you know, being a voice for the animals, promoting veganism, being gay, happy vegans. Um, I would love to hear you talk about um, in a compassionate way, uh, being able to be in community with with people who simply do not get it. And a perfect example is when you were sharing your story about your gay friend who had, who even with Prop 8 never passed, will never have the equal rights that you have yeah. um, until it's federally based. And just watching the disgust on people's face of what your friend said, even though in his life, he simply just wants 100% equality. Of course. Um, I would love to hear about that in a short, brief time. Yeah, I mean, for for me, I mean, a lot of my, you know, Prop 8 was a really formative, or no one Prop 8, I should say, was a really formative experience for me, you know, especially because it was concurrent with Prop 2, and, you know, the first black president being elected. It was a very exciting world at the time. Um, but, you know, something I say, and, and this has come up a lot since then, um, you know, people seem to think that vegan rights and human rights are mutually exclusive. 
and I don't feel that way. And you know, I, something I said a lot during that election was that you know, if you're voting for Prop 2, if you're voting to help the animals, it doesn't mean you're taking a vote away from marriage equality. You can be passionate about multiple issues, and in fact, I, I believe that um, you know, to, to truly achieve justice, you have to be passionate about multiple issues because no one issue is completely isolated. And, and as we see in practice, no one person is only one thing. No one person fits into one category and one category only. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I kind of, I hate to say it, but I, I kind of don't know what to tell you because, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just the ally in this situation. And it's, it's, how do you tell somebody, like, hey, this is incredibly personal. This is about other people deciding what rights I have as a human being. I mean, how do you convey that to somebody? That's, that's really difficult to do if somebody doesn't get it, you know? Like, how do you humanize a human, you know, to somebody that isn't seeing it that way? Um, so I, I'm sorry I don't have a, a magic solution. Um, I wish there was one, but it's, you know, it's just um, about really pushing the idea, like, hey, you know, animal rights and human rights are not mutually exclusive. Um, it's about, it's just about different interpretations of compassion. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. It's a sticky situation. Anyone else? Um, I think it's like with people hating hey. that um, they say, you know, health being, if we talk about health stuff with veganism, it's not good enough. It has to be animals. It has to be this. You can't talk about the environment. Why? Like, I think every, all of those things to me are just as important. And if that's something that's important to you, then you should go with it as much as you can. And, um, you know, it's just, I think it's just the movement where everyone's just trying to segregate rather than connect to each other. And um, it's just because they don't understand it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean as much to them. As, you know, for me, marriage, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to me. So I would find that hard to, you know, understand that. But because I'm open to that and compassionate about those things, and a lot of my friends, um, uh, are as well that I would, you know, um, I find out more information about it. So people, you know, other, you know, not interested sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I just say that you know you can be vegan and write exclusively about abortion access. You know, like that doesn't mean that you're not also vegan and completely compassionate about it, and really interested in talking to people about it. Um, so I mean, there are 24 hours in a day, and it's been a struggle for me to decide which things I want to focus my energy on. I think it makes the most sense to focus on the things that you are the best at communicating about, perhaps they're most personal to you. And so it makes sense that if that's the issue that you want to come from, that you would. And if someone comes to that and says, this is not important to me, okay, well, here's why it's important. And I hope you incorporate it into the issues that you're passionate about. You know, like, I, I, and I hope there's a lot of people that come to you and say, thank you. Okay. Like, this is there something, you know, like, I think you should focus on, like, those people and then Hopefully the other people will see, like, oh my gosh, this is so important to these people. Why is it important to them? Like, you know, our arguments strengthen each other's arguments. Like, this is like, we're together. Like, we are part of, like, social justice and progressive. Like, we want to make the world a better place for everybody. So that's why I talk about these things. Like, these things are important to me. Just send me all your hate mail down. So, if there's one more really quick question, we can do it. But really quick. Yeah. It's not really a question. I just want to say this is absolutely the conversation we need to be having. Yes, yeah. that we're talking about this. I'm, I'm getting my master's in humane education right now, and I spend every day talking about environmental ethics, human rights, and animal protection issues, how they all intersect. And I love it. And I think we just, as some people have echoed up here, you need to be citizen journalists. We all need to be out there talking, blogging, doing radio show. Um, because that's when these issues will come up when you're, you have one venue and you can sneak in the inner, because there's so many interrelated issues. So I just love, love that we're having this conversation and I want more. Great. Uh, me too. And I think on that note, that's probably a pretty good, because we're close, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone.